Hello, this is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your social media feeds or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I'm Vivi Ganeshanathan, also known as Suki, the author of the novel Brotherless Night. And I'm Whitney Terrell, the author of the novel The Good Lieutenant. Today, we're diving into a topic that's been on everyone's mind lately, how artificial intelligence will affect the field of creative writing. And we're not just talking about the technical aspects of AI in writing, but also the cultural and ethical implications. You're supposed to sound like a robot there, it says. That's not robotic <laughs> enough. Come on. <laughs> Today, we're diving into a topic. How will AI change the way see. we think about authorship, creativity, and the nature of literature? See, I do it much more like Lost in Space. I don't know if you're, you probably didn't see that show when you were a kid. I'm, I'm, sort, of, I'm sort of doing a Blade Runner way, thing. That's the way Danger Will Robinson it's a big topic and we're excited to dive into it with you. So whether you're a writer, reader, or just someone with an interest in AI, this episode is for you. Let's get started. Yeah, let's get started right now. So that robotic exchange was written by a bot. Oh, interesting. I should have known. What did you do? I signed up for a free chat GPT account. Could you tell? I... I know you've been trying to find and I'm some other way to write do these scripts than having to write them, but I don't think you're going to get to give up that job yet. Well, I hope that our jobs as writers are safe, but not everyone agrees. The world of publishing and education and even journalism and just the humanities generally have been kind of panicky in recent weeks about ChatGPT, the artificial intelligence chatbot developed by OpenAI, and ChatGPT came out in late November, and in recent weeks, people have just been messing around with it and also freaking out. Yeah, we've understood for a while that computers can beat humans doing things like, say, calculations or chess, um, but this feels different because Chat B ChatGPT is free, and it can write essays, and they're not bad. So I was trying to figure out what all this meant for the worlds in which you and I operate. And I realized we know someone who can help us figure it out, a writer who has actually worked with AI. And in fact, we've discussed her work on this show before. So of course, I'm talking about my friend, the journalist and fiction writer, Wahini Vara. That's right. And we're thrilled to have Wahini join us today to talk about what the latest developments in artificial intelligence might mean for writers. Wahini Vara was born in Saskatchewan, Canada, as a child of Indian immigrants and grew up there and in Oklahoma and the Seattle suburbs. Her debut novel, The Immortal King Rao, is a New York Times editor's choice and the winner of the Atta Galata Bangalore Literature Festival Book Prize and the Rosebud Award for Fiction. It has been shortlisted for the Center for Fiction's first novel prize and named a best book of the year by the New York Times, NPR, and others. Reviewing it in the Times, Justin Taylor called it a monumental achievement. It will be followed by a story collection, This is Salvage, later this year. Her essay, Ghosts, which appeared in The Believer and also appears in the latest edition of Best American Essays, was written in exchanges with artificial intelligence. Wahini, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So Wahini, as I think you know, we mentioned your essay, Ghosts, on the show just a few episodes ago. We were doing a live episode from the Writers for Readers uh, Gala in Kansas City that Whitney organizes, and, and Alexander Chi was the, the main guest there, the editor of the newest volume of Best American Essays, and we spoke a little bit about Ghosts. And you wrote Ghosts, which is about your sister's passing, in partnership with GPT-3, which is artificial intelligence that was created by OpenAI who are the same people behind the chat GPT bot, which is freaking everyone out right now and delighting, well, freaking freaking some people out and delighting uh, others. Is it freaking uh, people out? I didn't know that. Okay. It's really it's freaking, freaking people out. Freaking I guess that's why we're having the episode. While also delighting us in equal measure. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, so I want to talk about- Just so you know, my those... kids do not care either way about this GPT-3 thing. They, they, they're uninterested. No, it's the people oh, our age who are freaking. It's like, I, I think know. it's a lot of teachers. Anyway, TB, TBD, but I want to talk about the essay specifically in a bit, but I want for our listeners to start off by talking a little bit just about how this flat out works because I was messing around with it yesterday. You and I were just messing around with it on Twitter a little bit. So I'm curious, can you talk about how GPT-3 operates for our listeners? And if you've used chat GPT, which is the free bot that was released in late November, can you talk about how those two things compare? Yes. So OpenAI is this lab in Silicon Valley, um, co-founded by Elon Musk, actually, um, that developed this algorithm that can deal with text. So this algorithm is trained 
on all of this text available in this in the world stuff like um um well we don't know exactly but stuff like uh self-published novels and random information from the internet and chats chat conversations that trainers so-called trainers have created um to help these algorithms understand how to work so the, basically these algor algorithms are shown a bunch of text in order to understand how text functions um and gpt3 is a version um of what OpenAI created a couple of years ago and the way i used it was through something called the playground created by um open ai which was sort of like it was not open to the public like chat gpt chat gpt is it was um it was you could use it sort of by invitation so i got an invitation to use this thing called the playground and the way it worked was that you could and can type some text and press a button and that text will be completed for you sort of like the idea is that it will be completed in kind of a similar style um chat gpt came uh, um several months uh, more than a year later recently and what that is is um a different product a different tool that's based on some of the similar some of the same modeling it's sort of like trained in a similar way but um it has some more specific further training that teaches it specifically how to have conversations like to how to have chatbot style conversations and so you can't actually use it exactly the same way as I use this thing called the playground to generate text, or you can ask it to do that, but it's actually not going to be as effective at that as it was for me using this other tool that's not a conversation tool. Okay. And so that's so I signed up for, and we were talking about this a little bit at the top of the show, a chat GPT account last night and was trying to get it to to do that, was trying to get it to mm. kind of um you know complete text for me and then realize like that's not what it does and it was sort of like you know I and so then I started asking it increasingly specific questions and it was interesting because in a weird way what I was doing like kind of unintentionally I realized when I looked back at your essay was that I was kind of doing the same thing that you would like I was giving it more and more information because my questions were wrong at first I wanted to write the top of the show banter using chat GPT and so first I was like trying to banter with it. And it was like, I do not do that. Um, mm. And then I was like, I want to do a show about artificial intelligence. And then it renamed us the pen and the machine. That's our new name. And um, if every episode is about is about this. And then I was like, no, I want to write banter for fiction, nonfiction, a show about the intersection of literature and the Sugi news. Sugi has been trying so hard to offload the script writing onto something <laughs> or someone. Right. It is, she was so it is excited about this possibility and this is that she can't do it is disappointing i'm afraid but did it eventually work after it did kind of the code eventually it it kind of eventually worked but whitney and i end up sounding in this banter like like congenial robots um right right and just sort of like very and sort of like and for whomever might be interested in the world of intelligence and literature, like sail forward with us into this <laughs> unknown. You know, it's, it's like very, um, as you say, like kind of when you were talking about ghosts and I think it was maybe NPR where you were kind of like, oh, the like if I gave it a cliche, it gave me a cliche back. And yes. I felt like my experience was kind of mirroring. Anyway, um, Let's talk about let's talk about ghosts. Well, I wanted to first say that I thought that essay was beautiful because I'm sorry that your sister died. And I thought it was a amazing way of expressing grief. We're going to talk about the technology of the essay, but I thought the emotional part of the essay was the part that really landed with uh, readers. And we just did an episode about my old friend, Russell Banks, who died and death is difficult to deal with. So I thought that it was an excellent essay about death. Thank you. Um, and loss. But when you were writing it, as we were saying, you kept, Sugi was saying, you kept feeding more and more specific prompts into GPT-3. And your final essay features nine mini stories, each with more and more of your own writing and less and less from the artificial intelligence. It's a really sort of beautiful and strange progression. As you write in the essay, inconsistencies and untruths appear, but it started off with you writing just a line about your sister's death, which you hadn't written before that. When you wrote that first line, what did you expect the chatbot to do and what did it really do? 
And how did this response change what you were able to do next? I didn't know that I was writing an essay, I should say, to start. Um, I had access to this technology. And as I was playing around with it, I started to understand that like what this technology was promising to do was to help people write what they couldn't figure out how to write on their own, right? Um, and so I started thinking about what it was that I had never figured out how to write on my own. Um, there are a number of things, but for me, the most profound thing probably is the death of my sister. It's something that continues to be hard for me to write about. It continues to be hard for me to talk about. And so I think it was more, um, it was less, I, I had like my writer mind turned on less than just my person mind, right? When I went into this playground and wrote a line just saying that my sister died, having a sentence, um, actually I didn't say that my sister died. I, I said that that she had been diagnosed um, with this form of cancer. And I just left it there and allowed GPT-3 to continue. And in what it provided, in the text that it provided was about somebody, not me, a fictional character really, was about somebody whose sister had gotten sick and then got better and everything was great. And um, we were all fine and happy in the end. And reading that was like really difficult actually. I read it and was like, oh God, that's not what happened to me. That This isn't right at all. And so again, less as a writer and more as just a person, I was like, okay, I think I need to say more in order for this algorithm to understand quote unquote where I was trying to go. And so gradually I told it more and more. And I realized as I did that, I didn't know it from the outset, but I realized as I did that, that because the way these algorithms are built are in such a way that they can respond to what we give them, the more I gave this algorithm, the more it was able to essentially mimic my voice and even my emotions, the way I was really feeling. And when it started to do that, when it started to do the latter, it was really spooky for me. I mean, it was, it was quite accurate often. And there were times, sorry, I'm like, it still makes me emotional. Like there were times when the algorithm was able to like make statements, basically write things that I thought were like really profound um, characterizations of what my experience was like. Thinking about how that works when one is struggling to write about something that is so hard to address. I was just wondering if one of the ways that you were kind of able to move forward through the essay, and we're going to have you read a little bit from it for our listeners who, who might not have seen it before, but it almost sounds like talking to a friendly but ignorant entity that is kind of returning to you a lie about who you are, which then requires you to tell the truth, to erase the lie. Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's such a thoughtful observation. That's exactly right. Like that was fully my experience of it. Every time, every time I tried to get it to tell the truth, right. And it lied in response or made something up that wasn't accurate. That compelled me to be like, no, 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 no. Like it wasn't like that. Here's how it was. Right. And so it was that interplay, that dialogue with the AI that allowed me as a writer to be more honest on the page. And do you think, and I should say, I'm, yeah, I mean, this sort of experience, I haven't experienced that. But when I think about things that are hard for me to talk about, sometimes if I'm, say, at a cocktail party and someone's sort of like, but this must have been like that, if they're wrong, I don't correct them. I just go away, either psychologically mm. or actually physically. So I wonder if the depersonalization of the other entity is something that makes the response possible. It's like being alone, so. but not alone. Yeah, no, I think absolutely. I mean, it feels a little bit more like, I never felt like I was in conversation with a real person, right? It feels it felt a little bit more like when you're Googling something and like you don't Google it in the right way. So you just need to try again, right? Um, I didn't have to worry about what GPT-3 thought of me, right? Like it was clear enough to me that this was an algorithm and not a human, that I didn't have to worry about that side of it. And I think in human, in human conversation, the reason you kind of freeze or walk away is because you're actually talking to another human being. And you know that if you try to 
elaborate on what you're actually feeling, there's a chance they're still not going to understand and it'll be painful, right? But that that sort of pain of human relationships doesn't exist when you're interfacing with an algorithm. I can't even express how appealing this sounds to me. I'm so disturbed. <laughs> Could you read to us a section from Ghosts? I can, yes. So as you said, there are nine sections here and this is the fifth section. And by the way, each section sort of um, starts the way the previous sections did, but then elaborate. So the fifth one goes like this. My sister was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma when I was in my freshman year of high school and she was in her junior year. I didn't understand then how serious a disease it was, but it was serious. She died four years later. I thought I would die too of grief, but I did not. I spent the summer at home in Seattle, then returned to college at Stanford. When I arrived there, the campus hadn't changed, but I had. I felt like a ghost. At night, my sister would appear in my dreams. In the dream, she hadn't died. It had all been a misunderstanding. And she felt hurt that I had accepted it as real and continued on with my life as if life could go on. But as I said, it wasn't my life that was going on, not the life I'd had. As I said, I was a ghost. The truth is that even all these years later, I remain a ghost. You wouldn't know it if you saw me. I'm not morose or retiring. I laugh a lot. In fact, I'm genuinely happier than many people I know. But I can't help but feel that on one level, I do not exist. Here I should conjure my sister for you. Here I should describe her so that you feel her absence as I do, so that you're made ghostly by it too. But though I'm a writer, I've never been able to conjure her. I remember the same small set of details. And here's where GPT-3 sort of comes in and continues the thought. So I go, I remember the same small set of details. And then GPT-3 continues, her dark eyes, her long, thin fingers. But these are just the details that are universal to all sisters. If I describe the color of her eyes and the shape of her fingers, you might think I was describing someone else. Even though you knew my sister, you might not recognize her in these details. Why is it that though we look at our siblings so closely, we forget them so quickly? So I can't describe her to you but I can describe what it felt like to have her die. I felt like my life was an accident or worse, a mistake. I'd made a mistake in being born and now to correct it, I would have to die. I'd have to die and someone else, a stranger would have to live in my place. I was that stranger. I still am. That is kind of amazing that the computer wrote that part because it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Can I tell you, can I tell you guys the line where like, I was like, ooh, like this is good. How did it write that? Which one? Yeah. It's okay. So it's a few sections later, but that you don't need context to understand it. But there's this line where like that the GPT-3 wrote about me like driving home from a place with my sister and we stopped at a red light and she took my hand and held it. And then GPT-3 wrote, this is the hand she held the hand I write with, the hand I am writing this with. And like, that felt so, like the connection between like my experience with my sister and the fact that I'm still here and I'm writing and I'm alive and I'm actually writing this essay felt so profound. But then on another level, the fact that it's actually GPT-3, which has no hand and, you know, like is not embodied is the one who came up with it is like even more mind blowing to me. When you were talking earlier about how it's trained, I think that's the bit that I hadn't thought about before, like the way that it's the machine is some sort of aggregation of like all of human thought and feeling. Yes. Yeah. Um. I mean, <laughs> there's something right. Like we when we talk, I, I've noticed in the discourse when people talk about chat GPT, like they're often talking about it as a as a sort of war between like man and machine right like the tension is can computers write as well as we humans can but there's like the another john way of henry, looking at it john henry myth exactly but another way of thinking about it is like that these algorithms are actually um integrating all so much of what's been written it should be noted that there's a bias in what's in what's written and published on the internet and therefore used to train these things right like it's disproportionately written by white people 
is disproportionately written by men, et cetera, et cetera, which can lead to like biases in what these things are producing too. So I just want to note that as an aside, but yeah, I mean, there's something on a very basic level, very profound and very human about this thing that we think of as very mechanical. So, I mean, as we're saying, they write in this very human way, but then sort of one of the first major concerns I hear about chat GPT, and I'm not sure that this is a concern that I share, is about our jobs as writers. Are we going to be replaced? You know, um, and in Ghosts, you write, a machine capable of doing what we do at a fraction of the cost feels like a threat. That's from the introduction. But in your case, rather than shutting possibilities down, artificial intelligence seemed to open them up. And that's one of the things that's so moving about ghosts is that like in it, I sort of see like a ghost of my own future as a writer. Um, If you can have a ghost of the future, I don't know. So you had never written about your sister's passing and this made a path for you to do it, um, which is actually sort of like a very empathetic thing to do. Um, And so I'm asking this as someone critical of capitalism, but regrettably still living within it. Should we be afraid of what artificial intelligence means about the worth of our writing and are you afraid or do you see more possibilities for creative engagement with AI and like what should we be doing to explore that? I find it all really confusing which maybe is funny to say as somebody who's written an essay using using GPT-3 um, but I don't maybe this is telling it's not something I like really have really talked about but around the time that I wrote that essay I also wrote this short story using GPT-3 And it's really, I really like the story. Like, I think of it as like a really good story that I wrote, but I co-wrote. And I kept, but like, I keep feeling that there's something wrong with trying to publish that as my work. Um, And for me, I somehow see a kind of ethical line between there's a line and on one side is this essay I wrote ghosts um that in some ways is about AI writing right in addition to being written with AI it's sort of like a commentary on this kind of writing while also using it um and that feels worthwhile to me and it felt worth publishing and I'm proud of it and it feels like my work and I don't see an ethical issue with it but somehow on the other side of the line is this short story that I that I wrote using GPT-3 that I actually did send out to a couple of magazines um, and they both rejected it. But then after that, I said to myself, like, I don't think I wanna send this out anymore or try to publish it, but it it worked. Like, I think it worked really well. It like unlocked a really interesting, um, like it sent my story in a really interesting direction that I hadn't considered that felt like the right direction for the story. And yet it didn't come from me, you know, like, for me, it feels like feels like um, something that's sort of you know we've been talking a lot. There's been this sort of zeitgeisty question about whether AI writing can do what human writers do, and I have a feeling that it can. I have a feeling that like whether it's now or in two years or ten years, it will be able to write a novel like a really good provocative, moving novel the way we can, but the, but it won't be written by a human. And I think there's something about art in general, about writing in particular, that like requires it to be created by a human in order for other humans to engage with it um, fully. And so, so a roundabout way of answering the question is that I think for me, like, the fact that we're humans writing is exactly what prevents AI from potentially taking our jobs. I mean, and I'm talking about like real writing here, you know, like literary, literary writing, literary fiction, literary nonfiction. Yeah, I th- I think of it in this way, like, I feel like it's an extension of something that has been happening in writing for a very long time. For instance, in poetry, you have all kinds of restraints. You have sestinas or quatrains, or I mean, you invent these verse forms, right? They create a constriction that then create uh, invention to get around the restriction. Um, Or you could imagine, um, you know, the way that Yeats used automatic writing or the way that James Merrill used the Ouija board. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways of getting prompts, right? Or, Or exquisite corpse poems, right? So all kinds of ways of getting 
reflections back of, of ideas that then you can create and, and take in a direction as a writer. And so to me, it feels very familiar. It doesn't feel, that's why I was saying earlier, like that I don't, I, I understand it's a big news topic and I, and I get it. And it's surprising when the computer can write interesting things like that. But I also feel like it fits into a kind of ways that writers have found inspiration that has been going on as long as writing has been around. I'm curious what you think, Sydney, if you, if you have. Well, what you're answer. describing sounds a little bit like being in workshop with AI, like using AI to <laughs> give you a read on a draft and be like, have you considered taking your plot in this direction? And then if you stop there and you kept writing once you got that, like, say, one line from the AI, and maybe you didn't even use it, right? Like, like when you sit in workshop and someone's like, have you considered having a clown enter your story at this moment? You're like, that's a ludicrous suggestion, but it gives me an idea that... Yes that like helps me to open up the ideas of the story. So I like the idea of, I mean, I of course I'm invested in the idea that it requires something human to make art. And I, as you said, that was kind of like imagining an art gallery full of robot made visual art or, um, you know, and then I, I had caught a snippet the other day of like a news article talking about a novel that had been written by a, so I think it's been done already and I think that some of those novels are considered by the people who worked on them to be fairly decent. Um, so I think maybe what we're talking about is kind of like a question of audience, what the audience wants from the novel is to see something alive. And so if they know that it has come out of something alive, then they're interested. And if they, so I think maybe what we're relying on is like a presumption that people just don't want like a facsimile of life from a facsimile of life, what they want is a reflection of life from someone alive. And I really hope that that's true. But then it was like, what if we didn't know? Like if you saw a novel and you didn't know who the author was and its positionality, um, if it were a replicant. Well, then they'd have, uh, to, they'd have to go on NPR and get asked about their personal life and then they would never be able to get away with it, right? Then it wouldn't work. <laughs> you can't sell the book. But Maybe they but would what be that Sean I Young character. That story about what if I published that story that was co-written with AI and never told anyone? Like I have a book of stories coming out. What if I put that story in there? I didn't, but what if I did and like quote unquote passed it off as as my own? Would that be okay? Would it not be okay? It feels not okay to me, but I can imagine really? that opinion changing. When you say I wrote the story with with the GPT. Uh, what do you mean by that exactly? Did you, did you like, I mean, like in the essay, you did a lot of the writing. Uh, you, did you do none of the writing with the story? What What is the difference in your mind? No, in this story, I would say that like in the final version of it, I wrote probably three quarters of it, a good amount. Um, so I started writing the story. And then when I was stuck, I clicked enter. It's like, as writers, you two can appreciate the beauty of this, right? Like, I was yeah, like, oh, shoot, I don't, see the I don't problem know where to go. So I, I clicked enter. And then what you can do is do it over and over. So you could like click enter and be like, oh, that's not quite, quite, quite right. Let's try, try that again. Let's try that again <laughs> and let it do the work, right? And so it would write a bit and then that would open something up for me. And I'd be like, oh, okay, I think I do know what happens next. And so yeah. I would write a bit and then I'd be, you know, I'd be stuck again, or I would just be curious about what the AI would write, and I would let it write for a while. And so, in a way, it was a similar duet um, as as Ghost, the essay. Um, but the crucial thing was there was a plot point. There, like, it, it's a it, the not, the story follows a fairly traditional arc where there's a kind of climactic moment, and it was GPT three that came up with that climactic moment, which is confusing for me. It's weird for me. You know, well, my writer, mom came up like, with a climactic moment in one of my novels. I don't see why getting the idea for a climactic moment from somebody else is wrong. I hear you. You know, and it's interesting. There's this, we haven't talked about it, but I'm sure you are aware and listeners are aware maybe of this thing called Dolly, like D-A-L-L-E, which is an image generator also from OpenAI where you give it a text prompt and it spits back an image. And I was showing it before that became very public. I was, I had again, like a, a similar early access and I was showing it to some artist friends and was like, this is problematic for you, right? Like, what do you think? And all, one of them was a poet, two of them were visual artists, ceramicist friends, all close friends of mine. And all three of them were like, like Whitney, were like, mm, don't see any issue with this. We get ideas for our 
all the time from all kinds of places. And I think there's been this movement. I mean, there's a tradition, a long tradition in visual art, right? Of acknowledging the way in which every artist is building on what came before and the ways in which capitalism is influencing art, right? Like that's been a big conversation for a long time in visual art that I think allows a lot of visual artists to be like, oh no, this is just the next phase of that. This is normal. For me, it's more difficult, but I think like there's such a wide spectrum of opinions on this among writers. Like I think even among the three of us here, right? All right, so I wanna move on to what I think is the most important use of the G GPT. Um, now, I Suki's written this question as though this is a negative thing. So I'm gonna read it that way. And then I'm gonna explain why I actually think that it's a positive. There's creative engagement and then there's cheating, Suki writes in the question that I'm reading. Suki's on sabbatical this year, but I'm teaching. I know you teach too, and I'm hearing major concern from teachers who are worried about students using chat GPT to turn in bot written essays. That would obviously be hard to catch. You've taught in different capacities. Do you think chatbots and artificial intelligence should change pedagogy and humanities? Is it going to change how you teach? I'm really curious about what you both think about this. So I hope there's time for you You're to You're going to hear wait. in a minute. Okay, good. Um, so for me, I would say that it's worth thinking about what the goal of that writing is, right? So in a class in which students are reading a piece of literature and we're asking them to write an essay responding to it, um, so that we can analyze how they're engaging with that text or in a class that's intended to, you know, teach students how to express their opinions. And so we're asking them to write an argumentative text so that we can know that they have those skills, right? Um, it does seem problematic to me that they can now turn to a bot to, um, to, to write this stuff for us and sort of give the impression that they have skills that they themselves do not have. I think I know what's embedded in the way you asked the question, Whitney, which is that if there's technology that can do this and like this is something that needs to be done, but technology can do it, there's an argument that students no, no longer need to learn some of these things because like in their future lives, they can also rely on chat GPT to, you know, produce the text that their employer or, you know, their mother-in-law or whoever is going to require of them. Um, I don't know if that's what's embedded in the way you asked the question, but I can see both sides. Um, but I do, it, it may be funny because I wrote this whole essay using GPT-3, but I do feel like I'm somewhat more of a traditionalist where I feel like as a teacher, I want my students' writing to come from their own hand. I just want to know if GPT-3 can properly punctuate attribution and avoid run-on sentences and not use long strings of prepositional phrases. I think it can. I think it can. Okay. Then that You're would make my life like, a GPT lot easier. GPT-3 is going to make your life easier, right? <laughs> I mean, and I'm going to encourage the... all of my students to run their stories through GPT-3 immediately. <laughs> I mean, I think this gets at, right, some things that some secondary schools are like not preparing students to do before college. Like this is an experience I have of like having a student who hasn't learned how to write a sentence or a paragraph and it's not their fault, right? It's because of whatever school they've gone to that in some way has been under-resourced and they've gotten all the way to me. And, um, and it's, yeah, anyway, but what was embedded in the it's way that not I only the that Sugi, it's that there are people involved in rhetoric and teaching rhetoric in colleges who do not believe the grammar is what they should be teaching. I enjoy it. Tune into our video channel to watch how Whitney leaned into the screen to say this, like it's a dirty <laughs> secret. Um, so I, mean, I, I think... teach it in my creative writing classes and I am tired of it. Yeah. I mean, I do think grammar is, yeah, I find that there's a, there's a lot of beauty to sentence structure um, that I think sometimes I don't like, I, I wasn't trained in how to teach grammar. It's just something that I imbibed from reading and kind of from osmosis. And so I had to kind of reverse engineer my ability to teach it and think about like, how would I, and so, yeah, like a tool that would be helpful in teaching students grammar would be great. I'm in all of these Facebook groups or whatever, where I'm just kind of a lurker. And um, I've also seen a lot of articles I um, that are about like, like the Chronicle of Higher Education, for example, kind of like, you know, how is AI going to change higher education? I see writing teachers pondering 
do I never give a take home assignment again? And do I only have students write in class while I'm witnessing it? Which seems to me wild, um, right? Like I would just never, like, like the use of class time would change in a way that doesn't seem all that useful to me. So I think, I don't know, I, like Whitney said, I'm on sabbatical, but I think I would go for the model of like trusting that my students will just like that they are actually interested in acquiring the skill. And I'm heartened to know that Whitney's kids um, are not interested in using. Well, they are um, after they've been through my class, but I have some more snarky things to say about this, which okay. is that maybe this will cause the academic establishment who teaches, who does not do a good job of teaching people how to write, not creative writers. I'm talking the, you know, historians, writers, all the other kind of academic writing is bad writing. And they teach bad writing habits and they get in our classrooms and we have to teach them how to write better. And it is much easier to copy bad writing than it is to copy good creative writing. I think you can tell the difference when you're reading it in creative writing. And plus the students want to tell their story. So it's not really an issue for us so much, but it is going to be an issue for fields in the humanities that have not put an emphasis on writing. Um, They're bad writers and the, and the chat bot's going to do better. (laughs) <laughs> and all except for all of the historian guests we've had on the show who are fabulous writers. That's right. Heavy, heavy, heavy asterisk on this comment. Um, I meant to say anthropologists <laughs> and sociologists and I don't know, criminal justice people. <laughs> so, Wahini, I want to squeeze in one last question here because you were t- we've talked a lot about algorithms and I'm going to make a face like I totally know and understand what an algorithm is on a deep programmatic level. But anyway, um, can't even say algorithm. In the in the introduction to Ghosts, you make mention of how you and your husband, Andrew Altschul, who has also been a guest on this show and who's a terrific writer, um, you've been worried about, quote, technological capitalism exerting a slow suffocation on our craft. And your amazing and acclaimed novel, your debut novel, The Immortal King Rao, is also partly about technological capitalism. The narrator, Athena, her father, King Rao, leads a feature in which corporations and technology are kind of king. Um, and there's a shareholder government, for example. And like... Athena's mind is altered um, in a way that makes it like, I don't want to spoil things, but it's also like, yeah, anyway. So like her mind is altered by technology in a way that makes like a multitude of perspectives possible. And as I was thinking about her and thinking about your essay, which I think I hadn't thought about so closely together, I just kind of wondered how you think about the novel in relation to the essay, if working with chat GPT, or sorry, GPT-3, influenced how you thought about Athena or the other way around? Yeah, I mean, there's so many ways to answer that question. One way to answer that question, just on a craft level, because I know, you know, we're all writers and people who listen to the podcast are writers, is that I think like a lot of writers, I have a preoccupation with the way that people try to connect with one another. And then the way that like, we all sort of fit together in society. And so I think um, the fact, so I I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say that Athena can um, essentially has a technology embedded in her mind that allows her to connect with other people's consciousnesses. And, um, and I think there, of course, is a relationship between a technology like that and something, something like GPT-3 which is imbibing all of this human generated text, right? And then engaging with me as a writer. And I think um, I think it's sort of like fed the same writerly need on my part or the same writerly curiosity on my part. Um, it's also the case that I find technology really fascinating. I'm a, I'm a former and current um, tech journalist. I'm a business reporter. And I think there's this paradox for all of us and we're talking about it like it's a large part of what our conversation here has been about. We're like, like we're so drawn to and fascinated by technology and it's exciting and there's creativity behind it and um, there's ingenuity behind it. And then also because it takes a lot of money to build these things, technology is also sort of like embedded in these capitalistic systems that um, that entrench power and entrench wealth. Um, I don't know if people, people have seen, but open AI is, um, in the process of getting a huge amounts of funding to become bigger and more powerful and more wealthy. And right now we can go on Twitter and like share our fun conversations with chat GPT, but if it raises all this funding and if people love it so much, like 
this is going to become um, this is going to become a tool that continues to entrench power and wealth in the hands of those people that we've heard of who are already the richest and most powerful people in the world. And so that aspect of it is um, frightening and worth thinking about. And that's obviously, as you know, Sugi, this is the subject of my book. The subject of my book is sort of about like the way in which humans are like so creative and so innovative and technology is a product of that human, that very human curiosity and desire to create that is really beautiful. And then at the same time, because of the way that technology is built, it entrenches power and entrenches wealth. Well, Haney, thank you so much for joining us. We encourage our li listeners to go pick up The Immortal King Rao, which we've just been talking about, and also the newest volume of Best American Essays featuring your essay, Ghosts. Thank you so much for having me. We really appreciate your joining us.